so so yesterday we uh, we left I left you with these questions about we had this um, uh, skew product of a particular kind so I was having so I want to take f from C2 to C2 polynomial of the form so it's a skew product f of zw is equal to a little f of zw g of w where f and g are polynomials of the same degree without common factors and such that doesn't seem to be like very bread, very black this so I'm trying to make it yes such that maybe this one is better I don't know <sighs> they're all the same sorry I, I've been told by the cameraman that I should yes this is good I should check that you can see it on the on the screen and such that both so they are they vanish at the origin okay so this I think I'm not sure maybe there was some more hypothesis that I'm not uh, completely sure that I was put in but no I don't think so yes yes that was yes that was all I wanted to know to have so we have that W equals to zero is an invariant fiber and invariant means invariant with respect to the action of capital F and on top of it F restricted to this invariant fiber well X well, um, is equal to well little f zero of z zero okay so so this is what we have f at z zero is this map so this is a one dimension again where sorry f naught of z is simply by definition a notation to write down f of little f of z zero okay and so while well, the questions we had, so I'm not going to rewrite them down because otherwise we always do the same thing and we'd never go forward. But in here, so what, what I said is that we had this line, which is the W line in here. We had the point zero in here. So this is, of course, this is a bad picture because I'm trying to picture C4 on R2. So this is the best that I, I'm able to do, okay? So this is my, W equal to zero fiber, so it's a vertical fiber, is a copy of C, and on this C I have the origin which is fixed, okay, and the action of little f naught. And since little f naught is a polynomial, I can see, okay, I know that, so f naught is a polynomial, therefore all its for two components are pre-periodic okay and so up to iterating f if I give you a, a, a two component for little f naught I can assume that it's invariant okay up to iterate up to an iterate and so I say you have and so the question is if I have a one-dimensional invariant for two component for f naught omega f naught does there exist does it bulge to a two-dimensional uh, for two component which is a honest for two component so does it go so well you'll tell me if you can see it does it go further okay to a bigger one all right so that's the first question and imagine that this happens to for all the for two components for f naught is it true that is an in a neighborhood of this invariant fiber in C 
these are the only Fatou components that I'm going to have. So can I have a Fatou component, which is a honest two-dimensional Fatou component, which goes near by this environment fiber, then goes back, then near, and then goes back, and so on and so forth. So these were the two questions that we had, OK? And so, well, in this area, uh, this is kind of very recent as an area. And there has been some results. So I'm going to give you, uh, well, so for today, we are going to start with an account of the known results that, well, the results that are known in this setting. Uh, and the idea is that we are going to define, so if we have an invariant fiber, we can associate to it or not a Fatou component. But what we have seen yesterday is that if we have a Fatou component for capital F, we have to have, using the proje uh, projection on the W coordinate, a Fatou component for G. Okay? And so it makes sense to say, oh, look, I have a fixed point. I want to study Fatou components. So let me see what kind of fixed points do I have. Okay? And so, well, the definition, oh, sorry. As a definition, an invariant fiber, so the, in here, well, the invariant fiber is uh, w equal to 0. So our invariant fiber, w equal to 0, is a super attracting if g prime of 0 is 0. So if 0 is a super attracting fixed point. So remember that locally we are going to have a Fatou component, which is an attracting basin here, right? Around 0, which is a one-dimensional one, OK? But it could also be attracting, but not super attracting. So if g prime of 0 is less than 1, but non-zero, OK? So I still have contraction, but this time my contraction is less strong. I mean, if you iterate in dimension 1, w to the power 2, you go towards 0 faster than if you iterate 1 half w, OK? And it could be parabolic if g prime of 0 is 1, and it could be elliptic. Actually, well, this is not a good definition, but this is the definition we used. We should say maybe Siegel if g prime at 0 is e to the 2 pi i theta with theta irrational, and we have a Siegel disk. All right, so I'm going to try and have uh, more black color. So once you have this, we have a classification of invariant fibers, and we can see what happens if I have an, a super attracting fiber, <coughs> a su an attracting fiber, a parabolic fiber, or an elliptic fiber. OK, that's, uh, that's natural. I mean, why should we bother in studying them all together? It might be that. If I have something which is super attracting, then my life is easier, all right? And well, this is where the story started. So the first case, so the super attracting case, was studied by Lilov. And what he proved is the following. So I, don't, I didn't write down the dates. I'm sorry about that. But it's around, I would say, around 2010, more or, level, more or less. It's in this uh, kind of years. I don't, I don't have the, uh, the dates in mind. And yes? Oh, 04? Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I don't have very well in, um, in, in mind my, uh, the dates, because this was in his PhD thesis. And he never published it. 
So that's uh, that's the that's a problem. But uh, is PhD thesis is available, so one can uh, one can study on it. So, well, what he proved is the following. So in our setting, so f skew product as above. W equals zero, super attracting. Then all the one dimensional for two components of little f naught bulge to two-dimensional for two components for capital F. Sorry? What does it mean? Does it stay as a so actually what it means is that, so this means, i.e. there exists omega F. So if I have a one-dimensional for two components, omega little f naught, mm -hmm. there exists a big for two component for, uh, so it's a for two component for capital F, such that omega f intersected with w equals zero contains little omega f naught. It could be, so what could happen is that, well, say you have, it could happen, but it doesn't, but that's uh, more difficult to prove. It could happen that you have that this for two component, it's something like this. Could happen. Could happen that when you intersect it with the invariant fiber, you had, so this was not, see, well, this, wa this is uh, connected, but it disconnects when I intersect it. It's uh, like a donut, when I intersect it with a, um, with a plane, okay? And to prove that this is not the case, that's another issue, okay? And uh, for, for today, we're going to stay with this uh, easy statement. Okay, and uh, yes, and you find an idea of the proof of this result on the lecture notes that I wrote and you find on my web page. Okay, so the second theorem that Lilo proves is the following. So he proves it in his thesis again, and it's the following, well there are no, so in the same under the same hypothesis, there are no wandering domains and um, in the neighborhood. of the invariant fiber, which is super attractive. <coughs> so what it is telling you is that you had a bunch of for two components in here. So we've done it. So in here, you <coughs> proof that every invariant for two component bulges. And since every invariant for two component, well, maybe it's invariant, maybe it's, uh, it's coming up to after some iterates from a periodic for two component. He proves that all the for two components of little f are coming from a bigger from bigger for two components. Okay, but now imagine then then its proof goes by uh, contradiction. Imagine that you had a wandering domain, then he can prove by very very fine estimates that this to come nearby this invariant fiber, this poor for two component should shrink, 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 and shrink. And so essentially, at the end of the day, it should, it should smash itself to the invariant fiber, which is something that it cannot do. And so by using this, uh, um, actually, these are estimates on the uh, diameter of the Fatou component, he proves that this cannot happen. So you cannot have a Fatou component which comes, which if I give you a neighborhood as small as you want of the invariant fiber, you cannot have a Fatou component which goes nearby, actually which intersects this neighborhood. Because to be able to do it, 
it should drink, shrink too much afterward. So I mean, if imagine it does, then you have these a priori estimates that, give, that tell you that you cannot do it. Okay, so this is the idea of what he proves, and of course this is hidden in all the estimates that he does. Okay, so he has two results which are independent. One, this result is not dependent on this one, but this one is kind of dependent on this, on this result and on the fact <coughs> that the fiber is super attracting. So he solved completely the super attracting case. So of course it is natural to go from the super attracting case to the attracting case. And well, he did do something, something in the super attracting case. Sorry, attracting, not super attracting. So again, Lilov, again in his thesis, so let's say theorem 3, if f is a skew product, sorry, as above, but w equals 0 is attracting, non-super attracting, that is, g prime of zero in modulus is different from zero, sorry, let me, let me use this because otherwise we cannot see, so the derivative, the multiplier of g at zero is less than one but non-zero, then it is still true that all the one-dimensional for two components of f not bulge to two-dimensional ones. So uh, one-dimensional for two components of f not bulge to two-dimensional ones. But he was not able to prove in his thesis that by using this, he gets to the same result in here. So what he was able to prove is that all the one-dimensional for two components bulge, but now the estimates are not the same, because in here, you have somehow an exponential um, decay in the, in the inequalities, whereas in here, while well, the attraction rate is too slow to prove this. And so, well, um, well, what happened was that some, several people work on this, so, so let me just mention the names and what, what time is it? Yeah. And tell you what they did. So Peters and Vivas, so what happens was the following. In here he has some estimates and he says, well, I cannot, I cannot prove that they are true, that I can get good estimates to prove that in the attracting, non-super attracting case, I don't have wandering domains near in the neighborhood of the invariant fiber. But it doesn't tell you that, well, maybe somebody clear, cleverer could get to better estimates. Well, what uh, Peters and Vivas proved that well, actually, it's not that he was not clever enough, it is simply not true. So the, uh, the proof of theorem 2 cannot work um, in the attracting, in, in this case. So the question was still open, okay, but this proof doesn't work. Having a proof which does not work doesn't mean that the result is not true, right? And so, well, several people worked on that. So uh, Petter and Smith proved, so there is a first result by Petters and Smith who proved that uh, mm, if f not is, well, I'm going to put a name, but I don't, uh, I, I'm not going to define it because uh, this is not the end of the story. 
So if f naught is hyperbolic, then uh, theorem, uh, what was the name? Theorem 2 also, so the statement also, also for uh, f, well, for in the, super, in the attracting case. Okay, but this, is a, this was a huge restriction of f naught, and so, well, other people worked on that, and there is, uh, so more recently means, so like uh, three years ago maybe, so there is a theorem of G, who proved that, um, well, essentially, how to say it, theorem to alls, for, uh, well, let's say, let's say like this, when modulus of g prime at zero, okay, it's still positive, but it's small enough. And small enough means that he has a, uh, a constant that is universal, and it only depends on the, uh, on the geometry of the space, it only depends on the on C, where you can have a proof which works. So there, is no, there are no wandering domains when the fiber is sufficiently attracting. And actually, so I didn't check this because this uh, came out uh, very recently. So the most recent result on this topic is due to uh, G and I didn't write down down the name, I'm sorry about that. G with somebody else, uh -huh. I didn't write it down so I don't have it. Um, I would say that the name is Zhao or Zan, but I'm not sure, so that I'm not sure. So you know actually sometimes you go, and this is like uh, 20 February 2022, something like that. This is on the archive. And um, you know, sometimes you go to a talk and the person doesn't know how to write a name or doesn't remember and they do something like, yeah, something like this. And you cannot copy it. So I'm, I'm being honest with you, I don't exactly remember his name. I will try to write it down for tomorrow morning so that I can give it to you. So they proved that theorem 2 still holds, so no wandering domains near a super attracting fiber. Uh, in the, sorry, in the attracting, non-super attracting, case, when, uh, when F is unicritical. So, F is unicritical, I will not define it, but essentially what means what it means uh, from the uh, geometric point of view, it means that the intersection with respect to the critical locus, so where the, uh, the map is not invertible, we are in dimension two, so it's the critical lo locus is not where uh, the derivative vanishes. This doesn't make sense. It's where the derivative, the differential, the derivative is a differential, and the differential is not uh, one to one, okay? It's not injective. So this is where the critical locus lives. And in here, what they want is that you have your critical locus somewhere and the intersection with the invariant fiber is transverse. Transverse in the same sense as uh, Sergei, transversal, okay? So you, you only get one inter intersection. This, is, this means unicritical. This means that F naught has to be a quadratic polynomial. And so what they are dealing with is quadratic polynomials. And they, for the moment, they have some ideas on how to make this proof work in the multicritical case. So if I give you a honest mon mon polynomial in here, but it's still open. So because, yes, I'm trying to also mention some open questions that one can find in the literature. Since I will not be there tomorrow afternoon, I'm and I'm excusing myself already, but I will be on a plane tomorrow often. So I couldn't, I couldn't do both. It's difficult to do both. All right. Ah, cool.
cool. Thank you so much. You see? Yep. Yeah, and actually when you search for G, there are many people in China who are named G. So G is Zhu Chao. Yeah. Working with blue together, so. Yeah, no, it's okay. But it's um this is uh this is it. So you got it right. Thank you. Thank you, Francine. So this uh this is the story when we are in the attracting or in the super attracting case. So now, of course, well you see, I have a list. I've been very, very, you know, scholastic if you want. I could go to the parabolic case. Well actually, so let me just spent one word in the elliptic case, which is uh, still not completely finished. So in the elliptic case, we have a result with Petters. So there is a theorem. And I don't remember the date of this theorem, but it's the only paper that we have, the only two of us. And I think maybe it's 2617 or something like that, around this. Where actually we have to add up an hypothesis. So and the hypothesis is if g prime of 0 is a Bruno number. Do you want to ask me a question, maybe? Case. Yes. So we we we, we can get uh, uh, obtain the case attractive and super attractive at the same same time. Well, I mean according to this definition. Well, yes. Okay. So usually, what y one does is that you define an attracting point as a point which is a fixed point in an attracting basin. Mm -hmm. So. If you define it like this, so this is a matter of definition and of terminology, if you define it like this, the only thing that you can deduce is that the derivative at the fixed point, will, uh, the multiplier, will have modulus less than 1. Okay? Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to stress in here is that there is a difference, and actually there is a difference, for example, for the model, in between the super attracting case where the derivative is 0 mm -hmm. and you have some results, and the attracting case where you are not super attracting okay and that so actually I could have defined it as attracting like this and then I don't have to rule out every time not super attracting but this is not the terminology that Milner gave and since well I don't think that I'm better than Milner's so I mean he gave a terminology and I'm following him so I stick to that terminology and that's the terminology that people say use but for example I don't think that uh, Petter and Vivas and Petter and Smith and not even G made this distinction. It's just that it's a matter of being precise in mathematics and to, I mean, we are in a school, so I think that should, you should have the best that you can get. So, uh, are there other questions before I go on? No. But you're still with me. You're, you're, you're moving your head, so, so I didn't kill you all. So you're still uh, awake. So. If g prime, which is a, mm, a number of modulus 1, is a Bruno number, but I will not enter into this, okay? I will not enter into the definition. It's an arithmetic definition that you, you don't want to really know. The only thing that you want to know is that you remember g prime of 0 is going to be, we are in the elliptic case, e to the 2 pi i theta with theta which is irrational. But not all irrational points are the same. There are some irrational points that are too well approximated by irrational points. Okay? And if you're too well approximated by irrational points, it means that you can, you can come closer and closer and closer to 1. If you come closer to 1, then you might have a wee issue of having what's called a small divisor. This is something that it's well, this comes from normalization theory and linearization theorems. We didn't enter too much in the world of local dynamics in dimension one because I had to make a choice. But if we had done that, then in trying to search local coordinates to linearize our map, to change coordinates, 
and getting it equal to the linear function, then we would have encountered what's called a, a small divisor. And small divisor are, are, as they are being studied since long ago. The first, I would say, are people who deal with that are Siegel and Kramer. And then, well, there is Bruno, and the Bruno condition is known to be optimal in dimension one for the quadratic polynomial, and this is due to a cause. And, and it's also used in higher dimension by several people when they do normalization theory. And imagine, actually it comes out also wherever you don't expect it. So I've seen the Bruno condition in other, uh, like in uh, number theory. Uh, I saw it in a, in a talk once and I said, why, why are you using it? Because it's, it's kind of natural. It, goes, uh, it comes out, and the problem is that in higher dimension, we don't yet know if it's the good condition to use or not. This is the condition that people know how to deal with, but okay, who knows if it's the good condition or not. So, it's a condition telling you that, yeah, you have an irrational number, but it does a, it's, it's not so bad. It, you will be able to do uh, majority series who are uh, convergent. That's all you have to keep in mind in here. And so what we proved was that under this uh, stronger assum assumption that in particular tell us that we have a Siegel disk for G, then all, all one-dimensional for two components for little f naught bulge. But then, then you would like to know whether, okay, we added some condition, that was the only condition we could do. We could, we could be able to work it out. Okay, fine, but is it true that if, if G0 is a Bruno number, then theorem true holds true? And well, not quite. So what we proved, moreover, under some uh, more conditions on F naught, well, we can prove that theorem 2 still holds in this case. Oops, sorry. But of course, the general question, so it is still open. So this is an open question. Uh, say, well, um, well, first, actually, you have two questions. We are still open. First question is if uh, g prime of 0 is elliptic but not Bruno. Do one dimensional for two components of F not steel bulge. Ellipse, sorry, it's um, e2 to 2 pi i theta with theta irrational. But not a Bruno number. I mean, I'm, this is the, um, I mean, what you know in this case is that you have, a, I mean, we are assuming that we have a Siegel disk. So let me, let me put it here. Plus, we have a Siegel disk. for G. So we have some information coming from the, um, with the, from the, the fact that we have a global map and we have a Siegel disk. So this is not what, usual, what you usually have in local dynamics. In local dynamics, you have no idea what's happening. But in here, we have a Siegel disk, so we have a disk where we can linearize. And well, we have an irrational rotation. And what we would like to know, to know is, do, can we prove that one dimensional for two components still bulge? And there are some which are easy to deal with. So actually, 
one can prove, and this uh, I think we wrote it in the paper somewhere, all attracting components are always going to bulge. That's not the issue. The issue are parabolic components and Siegel disks. So Siegel disks are, are difficult to deal with. And that's, uh, that's an issue. Well, that's life. But that makes it interesting and still an open question if you want to work on it. And second, well, can we have wandering components uh, in a neighborhood of w equal na zero in this case. Uh, well, again, this is still an open question. So al already in here, so we had to add an hypothesis. Essentially, our hypothesis in here was telling us that we didn't have any Siegel disk for F0. So actually, it tells a little more, but I don't want to enter into that uh, because uh, I really want to tell you something about the wandering domains. Yes. Oh, no, you didn't have any questions. So, so why did people stop looking at the elliptic case? I mean, we, it's not that we stopped. It's just that. Uh, so because, well, G had started working in the attracting case, and he, and he was you know, proving stuff. So why should he move to the elliptic case? But moreover, because, well, we found uh, wandering domains. And where did we find them? Well, I, it's not on the board anymore, but we found them in the kind of, it, well, we felt, we felt it like the most difficult case. So in the parabolic case, I'm not going to use this one. This one is better. In the parabolic case, what we have is the following. So the question of do um, for two components bulge, we didn't really care yet about it, so it's still open. Let me erase all the backboard so that I have some space to write. All right. So and by parabolic case, I mean we have an invariant fiber where the derivative of G is 1. OK? So parabolic case. Parabolic environment fiber, if you want. So W equals 0 is parabolic, i.e. G prime at 0 is 1. OK? So in this case, a question which is still open is do uh, one dimensional for two components for F not bulge? And actually, we didn't care much about those because what we did, we tried to answer to the existence of a wandering domain. So remember, we had a first question on the board yesterday when we started talking about uh, rational dynamics in higher dimension. Can we have a wandering domain in the compact case higher dimensional, meaning on in P2 of C, on the complex projective space? And the answer is yes, we can. And so this is telling us that it's not that we were not clever enough and we didn't know how to make Sullivan's proof work in higher dimension because we don't have um, adverse bears measurable uh, mapping theorem, it's because it's simply not true. And so, it's, uh, so this is telling us that, yes, it makes sense to work in higher dimension because we can have uh, different behaviors. And so let me tell you, well, I'm going to write on the board the result. And well, I'll start. I'll go back to one dimension. You will see why in a minute. And then tomorrow, the idea is that we will try to have to understand the main, the key points in the proof of this result. OK? So this result, so it's a theorem. 
We proved it in a bunch of people. So a Stark, uh, Biff, Dujardin, Peters, and myself. And so we proved it in 2014, but then by the time it was published, you find it as 2016. All right, and so, well, what we proved is the following. I'm going to, so there exist a polynomial endomorphism of uh, P2 of C itself induced by a polynomial skew product of C2 with a wonder in Fatou component. Actually, what it is true is that we have a full family of those. But if you want, we can be more precise. Moreover, well, uh, more precisely, sorry. If you take F and G in, uh, well, polynomials, uh, yes, in one variable of the form. f of z is equal to z plus z squared plus o of z cubed. Yes, and g of w is equal to w minus w squared plus o of w cubed. But these are polynomials, so I want them of the same degree. Uh, yes, if the, well, let me, no, I will go there tomorrow. So let me be a little more precise in here. So I want it to be like, um, let's, let's see, yes, plus a z cubed plus o of z fourth. So the same degree has to be at least four. Okay, so we have it. We need it to be at least four. Then if A is close enough, sorry, to, uh, to one, and I will clarify it tomorrow, to one, but different from one, then F, as a wandering for two component. And since this capital F is a polynomial skew product and these guys have the same degree, you can extend it to a polynomial endomorphism of C of P2 of C, okay, as we saw yesterday. And this means that if you had a wandering for two components there, it has to go and to be a wandering for two component upstairs. Okay, what are the ingredients that we are using here? You see that in here I have two maps, so G as a parabolic fixed point. Parabolic means that, you remember, we were saying that if a two component had a was a parabolic domain, if on the boundary, if, if it is invariant, when it is invariant, if on the boundary it has a fixed point which has multiplier equal to one. But not only f as, uh, yeah, sorry, I have, uh, I didn't write, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Yes, where f is, sorry, there was something missing. Capital F of zw is equal to, well, little f of z plus pi squared over 4w, g of w, and that's it, okay? Sorry, that was the important part that I, that I had in my mind and I didn't write it down. I'm so sorry about that. So, again, 
So in here we have an invariant parabolic fiber. So what happens is that we have a parabolic domain in here. We have a so-called petal. We will, we will go towards there. We will start doing it today. And in here, in C, in this copy of W of C, which is W equals zero, uh, zero, again, look at the origin. Well, in here, the action of capital F is simply my little f. Look what happens at the origin. Again, the derivative is one. So what's going to happen is that in here, I'm going to have somehow a parabolic basin for little f naught. And so, well, the construction, what is going to give us is the following. So we are going to be able to prove that, well, we find, no, I'm not going to use this. Maybe the, the red is better. So what we find is the following. So we are able to find some Fatou component somewhere. And what we prove is that this Fatou component is going to come closer and closer to this map. So it comes closer, closer, and then it goes back. And then it goes, comes back again, and then it goes farther. And so it takes longer and longer to, to get near my invariant fiber. But then this doesn't tell you yet that it's going to be a uh, wandering component. It tells you just that you have this, well, Fatou component doing this weird stuff. And so we will have to prove that this component is indeed wandering. That's, the, that's another issue. So you find a photo component, you say, OK, it's going to do something. And then by, by this thing that it does something, you have to prove that it's indeed not per-periodic. Okay? And actually, all this construction boils down in, first of all, you have to understand the one-dimensional dynamics of parabolic points. And actually, it's really, so we're going to do it only in this case, so in the quadratic case. Of course, we can do it in the higher, dimension, higher degree case. But since we want to, to know what happens in this result, there is no point in doing all the uh, big picture. And second of all, what do we have more? Well, we have to understand what this perturbation does. So whenever you iterate your map, you know what happens to the iterate of G, and you have to understand how this W perturbation works. And before trying to understand what one calls a non-autonomous dynamical system, because at each step you are composing a map with a different map, with a different map, with a different map, what you should first try to understand is I am given myself a rational function, a polynomial that I know what happens to it when I iterate it? Can I, can I perturb it? Can I do some perturbation theory? So I change it with an epsilon, and then I let this epsilon go to zero and see what happens. In that case, I will compose my map with itself, but I'm going to change the number of iteration, and I'm going to see what's going to happen. I understand that this is very vague, but just, this is just to motivate you to get to one step further, OK? So when you read that paper, I think that it's kind of, so we tried our best to be as clear as we could. But of course, it's quite technical. So there is a technical part. And what, we are try what I would like to do in, in the, re the remaining time that I have in this course is to try to make it easier for you so that if you tomorrow you want to go and read it, you will have the key steps. And then you will say, OK, this is technical, but you will motivate yourself <coughs> to continue reading. That's the, one of the main difficulties when you write a, a math article. It's like, OK, I, I wrote a very difficult and very technical article, but then people have to read it and maybe referee it. And well, you know, your referee might be very pissed at you uh, because they don't understand. I mean, it's like, why do I have to read 10 pages of computations, right? Give me, give me an idea. So, all right. So, as I promised, we go back to dimension one. That was, so we went, we went to higher dimension, 
But to finish, well, we, we have to say something in dimension one. And you remember, I didn't tell you much about the parabolic domains case because I knew where I was going. And it would have been, I don't know, not at the right moment to talk about that. So let me erase. So while I'm erasing, I'm taking a little break. Do you have any questions? Oh yeah, well actually it's um so you homogenize. So you have a polynomial you, you have your polynomial, you you write z and w like uh, x over t and y over t, and then you and then you homogenize. You add t and you homogenize everything to the same this is why we need the same degree. Because otherwise you cannot have a polynomial endomorphism of uh, of C two. Yeah. You just it's it's really easy. And the fact that we don't have a common factor tells us that we don't have any indeterminacy set. The only point that we are taking out is the origin, which is consistent with the fact that we are working with a projective uh, space. All right. So where, uh, where was I? All right. So I was here. I have three minutes. I don't know. Yes, you are my chairperson. No, I think I have three minutes. <laughs> Yeah, three minutes before the break. So, so let me go back to parabolic dynamics. And dimension one. And, well, this is a well-established theory. This goes back to Lo and Fatou. I mean, this goes back, we, we are get, we're getting back to the beginning of uh, the transitive century. You see, it's, uh, it's kind of a, um, how to say, recent area. We have some, uh, some part of it at the beginning of the 20th century, which is not so old. It's not like, um, I don't know, uh, number theory. Okay. <laughs> but, but it goes until now. So it's a very active research area, I would say. At least I, I f it feels like that. And well, so now we have f from c to c, a polynomial. Of the form, so of, of some degree. So I want it to be of degree, well, actually, yeah, I need it to be of degree greater than 4 afterwards. But this is only needed because I want to deal with this result. If I didn't want to, actually, well, all I need to do is to have something which is a real, uh, really a polynomial, not the identity. OK, so of the form, well, f of z is z minus z squared, or plus z squared, OK, plus a of z cubed plus O of z to the power 4 at the origin. And this is not black anymore, so I will put it here. And I will try to use another one. Yes. All right, so, so we have our, our dynamics near the origin. And instead of staying in the origin, so what we want to know is we want to understand, so I will leave you there. So we want to understand what happens in the neighborhood of the origin. Because at the end of the day, so I have the origin, it's fixed. And I want to know what happens near the origin. I don't need to know what happens in all the space. Because at the end, this result is pretty local. So of course, we infer something about global dynamics. But what we do is a local study. So we construct an open sub set in, uh, in situ where we have local convergence, we then it has to, to, to lay in a two-dimensional for two component, and then we, we, we conclude. But all the construction is local. And so we want to know what happens near zero. But well, you know, iterating this map is not so nice. I mean, it's like, oh, OK, what happens if I didn't have this tail? Well, even if you don't have that tail, 
you do the second iterate and you will see it's going to complicate itself. So what's easy to do? What's easy to iterate? Well, linear maps are easy to iterate, but, uh, but this is not going to be a linear map. We cannot linearize. If we linearize, it's the identity. Nothing interesting coming out of it. So what, what else can we iterate easily? Translation. So if you can translate, that's easy to be iterated. And so, well, the idea to study the dynamics near the origin, this is a very clever idea, which goes back to Lo and Fatou. Instead of working in here, let's work with W, which is, sorry, this is, uh, let me use U. It's better. U, which is 1 over Z. Okay? If I take 1 over Z, maybe it's, uh, there is a minus, I think. If I'm not mistaken, yes, there is a minus. I knew, I knew my math, there is a minus in here. If I, use the, if I put this minus 1 over z, what happens to the origin? Well, the origin is going to go to infinity, all right? So now in this uh, u space, the origin is over there somewhere at infinity. And well, actually, my map, and so this is an exercise because I didn't give you any exercise and I'm, and I'm done, okay? In, in the u coordinate, This is an exercise. In the u-coordinate, f becomes, well, I take u and I send it to u plus 1 plus b over u plus big O of 1 over u squared, where b is equal to 1 minus a. All right, so this is what happens. And so tomorrow, what we are going, because my time is over, tomorrow what we are going to do is, well, I really suggest that you try to do this exercise. Remember, in the new coordinate means that I'm going to, well, first I will have to compute what's the inverse of minus 1 over z. That's not so difficult to do. And then I will have to uh, compose my map with phi and phi inverse on the other side. And this gives me the conjugated map. And it's going to be of this form. And now what you can do is, well, when you iterate this guy, if u is small enough, so, sorry, if u is big enough, this is very small and this is very small. So the only thing that matters is this translation by one. And so you know that you will find some open set somewhere where essentially the dynamics is translation towards infinity which means that there is an open set somewhere like this where, when you go back, not only you will converge to the origin, but you will also be able to say that you converge to the origin tangentially to one axis. But that's the story for tomorrow. And so for today, let me thank you very much and stop here.